to Calibrate It, a webcast about uncertainty, Bayesian inference, and machine learning. I'm your host, Eric Novick, and I'm very excited to have Lester Mackey from Microsoft Research joining us today. Welcome to the program, Lester. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Excellent. I have a few questions for, uh, for you as a customer, customer in our program. So first, you're currently a principal researcher at Microsoft Research. So what kind of work do you do at Microsoft? Before coming, before coming to Microsoft, <clears throat> I was a professor at, at Stanford. And one of the things that attracted me to Microsoft was that basically they said, you can just do the same sort of work you do at a university, except you have a little bit more freedom in how you choose to spend your time. So you can spend all of your time doing research or you can spend you know, some of your time teaching, some of your time doing research. And that seemed like a, a great degree of freedom. And so I work on all sorts of things. I've been doing a lot of work on climate forecasting of late to improve our ability to forecast beyond like 10 days. You know, we see these 10 day forecasts for weather. The reason why they, if they stop after 10 days is that basically the models are very bad after that. And a lot of those models are like wholly based on physics. So simulating, you know, how the physics of the oceans and atmospheres evolve. We're integrating more machine learning methods into that to improve and to improve ability to forecast. Um, so that's something I've been spending a lot of time on. I work a bit on cancer immunotherapy. So we work in collaboration with a few different um, clinics. And they're, they're interested in why this treatment for cancer. So this is a, this is treatment that basically allows your own immune system to attack your cancer and kill it. And it works very well sometimes. It works very well for maybe about a third of people. And by very well, I mean, it, you, know, you know, people who had like stage four cancer are now cured. But it doesn't work for everyone. And we don't really know why it doesn't work for everyone. We know, we know a little bit. We know if your cancer is more mutated, then it tends to work better. If your cancer is secreting more of this particular signal, then it tends to work better. But, you know, our understanding of it is very poor. And so we're trying to develop, you know, learning inspired biomarkers that can help us to identify if this is going to work better for you or, or not. That's another problem. I work on a lot of the more like uh, fundamental methodological developments, like some of the work I'll talk about today. But you know, most of my work is inspired by some particular application. And so that's usually where I start. And then I dig into the, the machine learning aspects of it. Wow. That's amazingly broad spectrum. That's really, really cool. Um, and I, I think I probably know the answer to the next question, but I'll ask it anyway, which is you seem to have a lot of leeway in what to work on. You know, people who uh, work in these commercial research or research labs, large co companies, you know, uh, always wonder how directed that research is. Is it, uh, does it have to have potential for commercialization or is it kind of like the old Bell labs where you could work on pretty much anything you'd like? Yeah. So research in our lab is very undirected. Every research com comes in and just does whatever he or she wants. As far as I can tell, the Microsoft research was founded to be like Bell labs. That is to give people free reign to work on like fundamental re uh, core research problems. And then with the hope that eventually that some of it will make money for the company, but that's not our direction day to day. So another, like lo lo looking at your background, you, you, you've also done a few machine learning competitions, uh, like the famous Netflix challenge and the prize for life challenge for predicting the Garrick's disease progression. What attracted you to doing these and, and, uh, you know, what's the secret sauce for, for doing well there? It's interesting. So the Netflix prize happened when I was in college. That was my um, senior year of college. And before that, and I didn't know anything about machine learning. And that was my introduction to it. Um, my friend came who lived in the same dorm as I did, like ran down the stairs when he heard about it. The announcement was, you know, uh, build a better Netflix, win a million dollars. There was some, some something on Slashdot that just said that. And he's like, oh, Lester, we need to, we need to build a better Netflix and win a million dollars. And so that was the original motivation, but we stuck with it because it was just so interesting. I mean, we would basically just start searching for different, so we learned about the problem at the time it was, you know, considered a huge problem, even just like getting all the data and being able to process that many, you know, it was, you know, data from like half a million users. It was a hundred million ratings at that time. It was like, oh, this is an incredible amount of data. How do you even put it on a computer? How do you store it in memory? But all these questions. And then once we figured, finally figured all that out, it was like, okay, well, what do we do with it? And so we started just randomly searching for different learning methods. Like what is, we started like, oh, we heard about clustering. That sounds useful. Maybe we should like, I'll oh, oh, try clustering for this. And we did, we literally just did that. We just took every method we could think of, regre linear regression, linear regression for Netflix, you know, clustering for Netflix. And we just kept trying to adapt every method we could think of to this problem. And it was this amazing learning experience on the one hand. And on the other, I was just so surprised by how much you could learn about people, like how predictable people were. 
like given like, all we were looking at is just the ratings that they gave to movies but we could learn you know you can certainly infer a lot about like you know the types of movies that different people like and what they're going to what they're how they're going to rate future movies and i thought this was just this was mind-boggling to me this is this was amazing that you could infer so much about people from such like in my mind such little spotty information and that's what actually led me to go into machine learning that's what that's mm -hmm. when i decided to go to grad school and, and study machine learning because of that uh, Netflix prize competition. I don't know what to say about the secret to doing well in such a thing beyond like being, keeping an open mind and being willing to try new things. So one thing that I think served us well was that we weren't tied, especially because we didn't know anything, we weren't <laughs> tied to like, any particular solution. Yeah. You know, we always, every, every, it seemed like every week we had a brilliant idea and we were like, oh, this is the idea that's going to you know solve the Netflix prize problem. But you know, it, none of those ideas alone solve the Netflix price problem. And so we were happy to just discard the, the solution to that, the challenge. You know, the winners of that challenge, we came in second, but the winners in that challenge um, actually combined, you know, thousands of different solutions using ensembling. Uh, and that was the final solution. Yeah, and so was our I was going to ask you that. <laughs> yeah, Chris, so, Chris yeah. Walensky, yeah. right. Uh, so I, I, I met Chris and uh, I remember him talking about like this massive ensemble model that that they built for it, but you ended up using, you didn't use an ensemble. You used like, you picked like one method that worked best. No, we also used a massive ensemble. You also used it. So, oh, okay. Yeah. 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 I would say is the, is what it took to win that particular competition. Right. And, but both like the willingness to do that, but also the willingness to, you know, to try out all those different methods and you know, implement them and combine them and also to work with other people. I mean, even with, even with the team that won, that was a combination of three different teams. It was a collaboration amongst three different competitors that came together right. um, and in the, each of each of which brought in different ideas. And so like being willing to collaborate, being open to new ideas, I think that was probably the most important thing for uh, doing well. Cool. All right. So before I turn it over to you, uh, just set, set the context for us a little bit for the research you're about to discuss. You know, what, what, what prompted you to work on MCMC and particularly the, the methods that you're, you're going to be talking to us? Uh, yeah. Well, so let's see, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of motivation for like the very specific problem that I'll talk about today, but more broadly, I would say that my interest in MCMC also came from the Netflix prize. So, you know, in my early days of grad school, a lot of the research problems that I explored came, you know, flowed out of that. And in particular, what I found was Bayesian approaches to doing these recommendation problems often work much, much better than non-Bayesian approaches, like, you know, frequentists, like point estimates. I think a lot of the tension goes to like frequentist point estimates. You'll hear people talking about, you know, matrix factorization methods for recommender systems. And where they say that just, you know, the matrix of users versus items and the, rec and the recommendations they provide are rep is represented by a low rank matrix and you just learn those factors and they use that to predict. And that works, and that works pretty well and you can do well with that. But what often works much better is just putting some priors on those um, unknown factors and then like sampling from a, you know, just doing Gibbs sampling, block Gibbs sampling over those two factor matrices. That works remarkably well, but it's also super slow as many MCMC methods either are or have gotten like the reputation for being. And, and so that got me really interested in, you know, how do you do faster Bayesian inference? How do you scale these sorts of things up? And that's, so a lot of the work I've done of late in MCMC and posterior inference, you know, largely for like an MCMC method for posterior inference, it's like understanding what methods work well and when they work well, came out of this question of, you know, how do I, how do we make um, Bayesian inference more scalable? And then how do you still know that your inference is good? And so I've done a lot of work on just like developing quality measures for Markov chain Monte Carlo samples, simply because, you know, there are approaches to scale up um, posterior inference, but a lot of them do that by like sacrificing some degree of correctness. You know, I make, I make some approximations. My, my Markov chain is not even converging to the right distribution anymore, but I do it in the name of speed. And that seems, and that seems like a trade-off I should be able to make, but how do I know if I'm making a good trade-off? Um, and so that's, that's what got me really interested in this space. And eventually all that flowed into what I'm going to talk about today. And I'll, I'll give you some more specific motivation, but that's how I can really excited about Great. This. Well, thank you for that. I will turn it over to you. All right. Um, if uh, anyone has questions for Lester, uh, please go to the stage chat and enter them there. I will curate those questions in what we'll have uh, a little bit of time at the end to ask and we may ask a few in the middle. So Lester, take it away. All right. Let's see, I'll share my screen here. So hello, everyone. Again, I'm Lester Mackey. Um, 
I was hoping to spend my time today sharing a couple of new tools that I've been developing for compressing a probability distribution more effectively than IID sampling or standard Markov chain Monte Carlo thinning. And this is joint work with a number of fantastic collaborators that I've listed here. So the motivation for this work comes from the field of computational cardiology. And here, scientists are developing these multi-scale, what you might call digital twins of human hearts. And the goal is to be able to predict disease progression and therapy response in a non-invasive way. And this is necessarily a, a multi-scale sort of modeling. And so, you know, you're interested in the entire heart, but to fully understand what's going on in the entire heart, you also need to model phenomena that are happening at the level of like a single heart cell. Okay. So let's take the example of modeling heartbeats. Now here, this is a phenomenon that's clearly like a whole organ phenomenon that involves a whole heart, but it's actually coordinated by something that's called calcium signaling in your cells. And it's known that if calcium signaling gets dysregulated, then this can lead to life-threatening heart arrhythmias. And so there've been whole lines of work just dedicated to modeling the impact of the signaling dysregulation on heart function. Let's take a look at what the, the inferential procedure looks like when you're studying heartbeats and arrhythmias. So if you want to model this impact, first what you need to do is you need to um, estimate that calcium signaling model. So we don't really know, we don't exactly know how calcium signaling works, but we have reasonably good models for it. And those models have unknown parameters. And so you're going to learn those parameters from patient data. And as soon as you estimate something like, you know, the unknown parameters in a model, you have some uncertainty. And so now you want to capture that uncertainty. And a typical way of doing this is by um, sampling many different likely parameter configurations from the posterior distribution over those unknown parameters. So how do you do this in practice? Typically, you're going to run Markov Kane Monte Carlo, MCMC, to eventually draw sample points from your posterior. We'll call that posterior distribution P. And at this point, things are starting to become difficult. So for the sorts of models that we're dealing with, this might be a, you know, a 38 dimensional model to capture all the different parameters in calcium signaling. You're typically going to require millions of sample points just to adequately explore your target distribution P. What do you want to do next? Well, we're only interested in the uncertainty in calcium signaling because we're interested in the uncertainty about your heart. We want to know what's going to happen to your whole heart. And so we need to propagate that uncertainty through your whole heart model. This usually means simulating the whole heart for each of your sampled configurations. And this is actually very problematic because every whole heart simulation today costs thousands of CPU hours. So what can we do? Well, this is, this is what leads to the questions of today's talk. Um, and the big question here is, can we accurately summarize our distribution P using many fewer sample points? We're starting with millions from MCMC. Can we get away with many fewer? And if so, how? Well, this is also the goal that's at the heart of what, what I like to call distribution compression, where your goal is to accurately summarize a distribution P using a small number of points. And I think you're likely already familiar with some standard approaches to distribution compression. The most common are IID sampling directly from P. And more generally, if you can't do direct sampling, Markov chain Monte Carlo with a Markov chain that's converging to P. As I'm showing you in this little picture on the right, here's your original distribution P and here's your, here's the trajectory of your Markov chain with sampled points. And the benefit of either of these solutions is that they're readily available and that they're eventually high quality. And what I mean by this is that if you're trying to approximate expectations of your target distribution in red, then each of these approaches provides you with asymptotically exact sample estimates. So I can just take an average over the points x1 through xn sampled IID or from my Markov chain, and eventually that's going to converge to this otherwise intractable expectation. So that's nice. But there's also a drawback. And the drawback is that the samples produced via IID sampling, say, are too large. Your typical integration error is going to be n to the minus one half, which means that just to get down to 1% relative error, you need 10,000 points. And that's going to be prohibitive for expensive downstream tasks and function evaluations like simulating your entire heart. So what can we do about this? Well, one idea is that let's start first with these high quality sample approximations that we get from MCMC, and then let's try to compress those into smaller representations that are about as good. 
at least this will reduce the general problem of approximating P, just approximating an empirical distribution like Pn. So how do we do that? How do we compress an empirical distribution? Well, you could start at the same place. You could say I could just do IID sampling from the empirical distribution or uniform subsampling. You could do what's called standard thinning in MCMC, which means just keep every teeth point. That's a pretty common thing to do. And you might end up with just this subsample of red points on the right. But there's still a drawback, which is related to the, pr the prior drawback, which is that if you do standard thinning, you often get a large loss in accuracy. Your worst case integration error goes up, up by a factor of square root t. And this means if you want to do heavy compression, if you want to compress endpoints down to square root endpoints, then your error is going to go up from n to the minus 1 half up all the way up to n to the minus 1 quarter. And that's a, that's a big loss in accuracy. So a natural question is, can we actually do better than that? And to understand that, it's helpful to look at the lower bounds for this problem. There actually are many max lower bounds for compressing a distribution P in terms of integration error. And they tell us first that any compression procedure that returns only square root endpoints, if you're doing heavy compression, uh, must suffer at least n to the minus 1 half error for some target. And they also tell us that any approximation that's based on only n IID points from P must suffer at least n to the minus 1 half error. So that's good. The two minimax lower bounds are agreeing. They're saying you can't really do better than n to the minus 1 half. But that means we should be able to do, in the best case, as well as Pn itself, even though we're only outputting square root endpoints. So we'd like to be able to output square root endpoints, but still retain the full n to the minus 1 half error that we started with. So that's going to be the goal for this talk. And during the talk, I'm going to try to introduce a more effective compression strategy that we call kernel thinning that actually matches these lower bounds up to log factors. All right, so here's a problem setup. Here, I'm going to be given a set of input points. I'll call that S in, those X1 through Xn. They're going to be in d-dimensional input points. I'll call the empirical distribution of those points Pn. And I'm not going to say much about where these points came from. They should be offering us a good approximation to the target P, but otherwise they could be pre-generated by any algorithm. So they could be coming from IID sampling. They could be coming from MCMC. You could even use your favorite quadrature rule to generate points, or you could use a procedure like kernel herding. You can do whatever you want. Pre-generate it. Give me the endpoints. I want them to be a good approximation. I want PN to be a good initial approximation to P, and we're going to compress it. Okay, so you also need a target output size. I'll call that S. You should think of S as basically square root N if you want to do heavy compression. And so now our goal is just going to be to return a core set S out of size S. And that core set is going to only have S, S of the original endpoints. Now we have a couple of um, desiderata. We have some goals for this core set. So first, I want to call the empirical distribution of that output set Q. And I want it to be the case that this core set is giving us a better approximation than IID sampling. I could have always just taken, I could have just randomly take an S of my input points, and that's going to give me some error. It's going to give me S to the minus 1 half error. So I want a core set that has better quality than that. OK, and so speaking of quality, how are we going to measure the quality of our core sets? Well, given that we care about this integration error between Pn and Q, I think it's natural to consider what's called a maximum mean discrepancy, which actually measures the maximum discrepancy between your input and core set expectations over a class of real value test functions. Now, these MMDs, MMDs for short, are, are parameterized by a reproducing kernel, K. And the kernel is just any function with two arguments that's symmetric in those two arguments, and that's positive semi-definite, meaning if you, apply, if you form the matrix of pairwise kernel evaluations over n points, that matrix is always a positive semi-definite matrix. And so here are some common examples. There's a Gaussian kernel, also called the squared exponential, which just looks like a Gaussian density applied to x minus y. And here's a second, which is called inverse multi-quadric, which has a, a polynomial decay, which will come up again later. OK, so you pick your kernel function. And if you pick it correctly, if you pick, if you pick your kernel function from a class of what are called universal kernels, then this MMD is going to actually metrize convergence and distribution. And so that's nice, because at least we know that um, if we're controlling MMD, we're actually controlling the integration error for all you know, bounded continuous functions. So we're going to need one other piece one other element for me to present the algorithm to you. And this algorithm, is, this element is called a square root kernel. And a square root kernel is just another kernel that when you integrate it against itself, gives you back your original kernel. So this is the definition precisely written here. 
And it turns out that square root kernels are really easy to find for many standard kernels. For Gaussian kernels, Matern kernels, B-spline kernels, all pretty common universal kernels, it turns out that the square root kernel is just another member of the same family. So for a Gaussian, if your bandwidth is sigma, so what are we going to do with all this? I'm going to give you an algorithm now to do compression. It's called kernel thinning. It proceeds in two stages. The first stage is what I like to think of as an initialization stage. We call it KT split. And what you're going to do is you're going to take your input points, S in, and you're going to split them into, you're going to partition them into 2 to the m candidate core sets, each of size n over 2 to the m. And you're going to do this using non-uniform randomness so that the core sets are basically balanced with respect to one another, that they're all pretty similar to one another. So you should think about our heavy compression setting. So for heavy compression, you're going to pick m to be 1 half log n, which means you'll get square root n core sets of size square root n. OK, so now we have a lot of candidate core sets. And now we're going to refine. So we do the refinement step that's called KT swap. I'm going to pick the best of those candidates. I'm going to pick the core set that's closest to S in in terms of MMD. And then I'm going to iteratively refine that core set by replacing each of the points in it with a different input point if it improves the MMD. All right, so you do that. You run that refinement step. You do one pass through your core set. The whole algorithm takes time, n squared time. It takes n squared time. It's actually just dominated by forming the kernel evaluations between pairs of points. And then the space complexity is, is either nd or n squared, the minimum of those two, depending on whether you want to store your kernel matrix or if you just want to store the original data set. So I've actually fully defined the swap algorithm. I don't really want to say anything more about that. But for the split stage, I want to give you a little bit more detail into how it works. So here's a cartoon. The way I'm going to partition my data set is recursively. I'm going to start with my endpoints. I'm going to split them into half, into two halves. I'm going to split each of those halves into two quarters, and then switch each of those quarters into two eighths, and so on, until I get down to my target size of two to the m. And so then I get this row at the bottom, these leaves, two, two to the m core sets, each of size n over two to the m. Now, if I just focus in on one of these core sets, like SM1, oh, and just, sorry, just have one other thing. This, even though I've written it in this very sort of batch way, the algorithm actually runs online. And so after, after processing i input points, you will have output core sets of size i over 2 to the m. So if you don't know your target, if you don't know your full input size, or if you want to do this in a streaming way, you still could. Um, and the algorithm handles that. Let's take a look at one of those points. So like each of those, one of those output core sets, S, M, L. You can think of each output core set as the result of what I'll call repeated kernel halving. And so on each round, I'm going to take all of my remaining points. I'm going to pair them up arbitrarily. And then from each pair, I'm going to pick just one point. And I'm going to use some, I'm going to use randomness to pick which of those two points, but it's not going to be uniform randomness. It's going to be biased randomness. I'm going to tend to pick the point that leads to more balance in my core set. And I'm not going to give you any more of the core details than that, but I'll just say that this is using a new Hilbert space generalization of a beautiful algorithm doing to Elwise et al. called the self-balancing walk. OK, so let's just see what we can get out of this of this approach. Here's a theorem from our paper. It basically says that let's say that your distribution and your kernel are compactly supported. Pick your favorite compactly supported distribution. Then the MMD given by kernel thinning is square root log n over n. Now you can compare that with what you would get um, if you were compressing using just IID sampling. So here I'm outputting square root n points and I'm getting square root log n over n error. An equal sized IID sample would have n to the minus one quarter error. So this is, we saw before that the optimal rate would be one over square root n. So this is, you know, near optimal up to that, that extra log n, square root log n factor. All right. Now, what if you don't have compactly supports? What if you have like a, you know, a heavier tail distribution? Well, you can deal with that too. You get hit with some extra dimensional factors, some extra log powers, but you still get, you know, log powers over square root n. And the form of these guarantees, basically log n to the d over square root n, is reminiscent of what you see from the quasi Monte Carlo literature. There's a long, there's a, there's a rich literature on um, beating IID sampling when you're approximating the uniform distribution on zero on, on the unit. This is called quasi Monte Carlo, and their error rates look very much like the ones that I'm showing you here for MMD. But what I want to highlight is that. Quasi Monte Carlo focuses specifically on you know, uniform distributions on the unit cube and exploits the symmetries thereof. And here we want to design something that will work 
for more general distributions on R to the D. And everything I'm presenting is in terms of big O, but if you take a look at our paper, you'll see non-asymptotic bounds with explicit constants and also error rates for other compression sizes besides square root n. All right, so let's just, to put this into some context, let's look at some related work on forming compressed MMD core sets. As I already mentioned, um, Quasi Monte Carlo gives you better than IID core sets when your target is specifically the uniform distribution on, on the unit cube. The same is true for the recent online horror strategy of Duivetti et al. More generally, there are a number of procedures that, that um, produce MMD core sets for general P, but for all the procedures I'm about to mention, the rate of decay is the same as IID sampling. The known rate of decay is the same as IID sampling. So if you use IID sampling, or even if you use the iterates of a geometrically ergodic Markov chain, you're expecting, you'd expect to get n to the minus one quarter error in terms of MMD. Meanwhile, there are other procedures like kernel herding, Stein points, MCMC, and greedy sign selection, which, all of which aim to improve upon IID sampling, and they do, um, but the rates, the best known rates, are still n to the minus one quarter. Now we have, there have been established improvements when you're interested specifically in linear kernels on R to the D. And so there you can, you can show, you know, much better than n to the minus one quarter rates, for instance, using the discrepancy construction of Harvey and Samadhi. But this doesn't cover the sorts of infinite dimensional kernels, the ones that control convergence that we're interested in here, like Gaussian and, and B-spline and Matern. And then there are also a number of other procedures that which work well in practice, but have unknown core set quality. So I'll just highlight a couple of those. Uh, one is super sampling with a reservoir. Another is the support points algorithm of Mac and Joseph. This one is particularly interesting because they study a type of MMD called the energy distance. And there they show that the best core set of size squared n actually is better than n to the minus one quarter in terms of its error, but they don't provide a construction for that best core set. Instead, they provide a particular procedure that seems to work well in practice, but isn't analyzed or, or shown to be optimal. Okay, so let's see kernel thinning in practice. Just to highlight some, first I'll just try to highlight some of the properties with some like very simple illustrations. So here we're showing, I'm showing you what the output of IID sampling versus kernel thinning. So my target here is um, a mixture of Gaussians, four components. I've shown you the equidensity contours of the, of the target here. And on the top, I'm showing you what your what IID samples look like, an IID sample of size 8, 16, 32. At the bottom, I'm showing you the, sem the same, but using kernel thinning, 8, 16, 32. And what do we see? First, we see that even for very small sample sizes, kernel thinning is providing much better stratification, meaning that we're getting you know, roughly balanced numbers of points sitting at each of the, uh, the modes of the distribution. Whereas with IID sampling, just because of randomness, you're going to get imbalances, more points at one than another, less coverage at another. And then also for larger numbers, of, larger sample sizes, you're seeing um, fewer big gaps and less clumping than you would get from IID sampling. Here is the same setup, but now with, a, with an eight component mixture of Gaussian, and I think it becomes even more, the difference becomes even more stark. Whereas, you know, look at eight points here. The first eight points picked by kernel thinning are, are just one point per mode. But with IID sampling, you end up with a number of modes that have no coverage at all. And this pers that persists even into larger sample sizes. Okay, and this is also reflected in the error plots if you actually measure the MMD, which I, so because of this particular kernel, the kernel I'm using is a Gaussian kernel, it's a mixture of Gaussian to target. I picked that so I can exactly compute the MMD um, to the target distribution P. And what you see is that if I compare IID samples of increasing size to um, kernel thinning samples of increasing size in blue, you see um, significant improvements, both in terms of the rate of decay. You know, IID sampling has the n to the minus one quarter rate. Kernel thinning has the n to the minus one half rate here. Um, and also just in terms of the order of magnitude, their MMD actually is just much smaller than it used to be. And showing you that for, for different Gaussian mixtures with different numbers of components, so four, six, or eight components. Now that was focused on these 2D mixtures of Gaussians to, to show you what impact we have and what impact dimension has on this performance. I'm now going to make a, use a standard Gaussian target in D dimensions. Again, a Gaussian kernel, and I'm going to compare IID sampling to sampling with kernel thinning. And what do we see? Well, we see that we see basically the same plot we saw before for dimension two, similar for dimension four. As we get up to dimension 100, 
now we're in a pretty small sample size regime. Our, our, our number of sample points is actually below when we start, yeah, when we start, the number of sample points is actually, you know, smaller than the dimension. And yet we're still seeing improvements. That is, we're improving both the rate of decay and the order of magnitude, even for very small sample sizes in high dimensions. And so you still see this gain, even if you're only going out to two to the six points from using kernel thinning over using IID sampling. So those are all IID compression setups. Let's look at compressing Markov chain Monte Carlo. So for this, we need some actual posterior targets. We're going to do posterior inference for um, various systems of ordinary differential equations, ODEs for short. So P is now going to be the posterior of the ODE model parameters given observed data. Um, we have three different models that we'll study. First is the Goodwin model, oscillatory as an enzymatic control. That's a four-dimensional posterior. The second is the Lotka Volterra model of oscillatory predator-prey evolution, another four-dimensional posterior. And the third is this a hinge model of cardiac calcium signaling that I alluded to at the beginning of the talk. It's a 30 dimensional, 38 dimensional target. And remember here, our downstream goal is to first capture the uncertainty of the signaling model and then propagate that uncertainty through a whole heart simulation. So every sample point that I can discard via compression is going to translate into thousands of CPU hours saved. We're going to use a number of different Markov chains. Four different in particular, so I'm going to use a Gaussian random walk MCMC algorithm, an adaptive random walk, tropolis adjusted Langevin algorithm, MALA for short, and preconditioned MALA, PMALA. And I'll highlight that for the hinge model, just generating the random walk chain of length 4 million took two weeks of CPU time. And so the, the, both the Markov chain sampling time and the downstream costs are going to dwarf the costs of doing the compression itself. Okay, so let's jump in. What do we see? Here are the results from all the different markers. So four different Markov chains for the Goodwin model, four different Markov chains for Laka Volterra, uh, and four different settings for the Hinch model. Here I had two different independent runs of the same chain, as well as two different independent runs targeting a tempered version of the Hinch posterior. And so what do we see from all these plots? Well, overall, we're still seeing that KT is improving the rate of decay. It's also improving the magnitude of MMD. And in, you know, in the top two lines, standard thinning is not doing an especially good job. You know, it's about what we expect. You know, it's end to the end to the quarter or worse in most cases. And we're seeing, you know, end to one half or better in most cases from kernel thinning. In the hinge example, somewhat surprising, we found that standard thinning did very well. It already had, you know, end to the minus 0.45 error uh, decay rates, which is, you know, unusual for standard thinning. But even in those cases, Kernel thinning still continue to improve, improving both the rate and the order of magnitude. And if you can see here, like this um, increase, this decrease of a factor of two. So for the same quality, we're using half as many points. And that's very important for these downstream tasks where every point costs thousands of CPU hours. Okay, great. So it seems like all the problems are solved, but there's something wrong here. And it's something that you couldn't really, you can't just see from looking at these error plots. And that's something is that in that hinge example, so this wasn't true for the good winner, Lotka Volterra, but in the hinge example, the mark of chains haven't actually mixed. That is, they don't provide a good uh, approximation to P. And that's a problem because all we've been doing so far is just compressing PN. But if PN is a poor approximation to P, then a compression of PN is also going to be a poor approximation to P. So how do I know they haven't mixed? Well, I said that I ran two different independent runs of a mark of chain for the hinge. And if you look at the if you look at the marginals, the marginals from those two different runs, which I've shown you here, one in red, one in green, the marginals don't look anything like each other. They don't even overlap in most of the cases, which means that the two different runs are getting stuck in you know, different local modes and certainly haven't mixed. So that's a problem. That means we can't really trust PN. Often when one runs into this sort of situation, you run your Markov chain for a long time, you don't have good mixing, you, you opt to use a more diffuse tempered posterior instead. You, know, you choose a different posterior that's kind of like your original one that allows for faster mixing, and then you just target that with your Markov chain. So we can do that, and we're going to do that. But the problem is that this tempering induces, introduces a persistent bias. Your MCMC points, your PN, is going to be summarizing the wrong target distribution. It's not going to be summarizing the target P that you care about. That's a problem. And so a natural question is, can we correct for these sorts of biases?
in particular, can we correct for these sorts of biases while we're doing compression? And you know, this is not the only sort of bias that could come up. We so you you know, it could be you could have biases due to tempering and other sorts of off-target sampling. But there are other biases that naturally arise when we're doing MCMC. If you want to use approximate MCMC that doesn't exactly target P but runs more quickly, the same sort of issue arises. Even the same issue also arises just from burn-in. I showed you this plot earlier of the trajectory of a Markov chain, which started somewhere around here and then eventually found its way into the, the posterior modes of your target. But this whole tail, this whole tail of points is you know, uninteresting. It doesn't actually represent the posterior that I'm targeting. It just represents the path I needed to take to get to the posterior. And so you ideally like to discard that tail as well when you're, um, when you're doing compression. So how do we correct for all these sorts of biases? Well, the thing is, you can't do this just by looking at PN. In order to understand, in order to, uh, in order to get rid of these biases, you need to be able to measure distance to the true target P. And so let's take a, let's, let's figure out how to do that. Let's, let's revisit our measurement of quality before we are measuring the quality between PN and Q, and we're using these maximum mean discrepancies. So instead of PN and Q, let's just try to plug in P. Let's just measure distance directly to P, the continuous target distribution that we care about. And one helpful realization is that this MMD that we've been working with has a nice closed form in terms of just the integrals of your kernel under your, your target P and your approximation Q. But I think that also reveals a big problem with MMDs. And the big problem is that integration under P is typically intractable. That's actually why we're doing sampling in the first place. And so in, in practice, the integral of K under P and the MMD of PQ typically can't be computed for most kernels. So here's an idea to potentially get around this. What if we only consider kernels with special kernels, I'll call them KP, that are known a priori to be mean zero under the target distribution. So kernels KP with PKP equal to zero. Well, if we could do that, then it would get rid of all the integration under P in this expression. And then the whole MMD computation would only depend on Q. And that's something that we can potentially compute. Okay, so this is gonna be the idea that we're gonna use. And this is exactly the idea that motivates what is called a kernel Stein discrepancy. This is a special sort of MMD that has been developed independently by several different groups. And you, for this, you use a special kernel. This is what the kernel looks like. Uh, I won't really go into the details of why this looks this way, but it has uh, some nice properties. First, um, well, let's jump into the properties. So first, it only depends on P through the gradient of the log density. So first, we're going to be targeting, we'll have to be targeting distributions that actually have log densities and ones that have differentiable log densities. But when you have that, this kernel is going to be computable even though the normalization constant is unknown, because it only depends on the gradient of your log density. So that's nice. And under some mild conditions, it's also going to be mean zero under your target distribution. So like whenever your grad log density is integrable, um, this is going to be a mean zero kernel, which is great, which means because that means mean zero kernel means we can compute the MMD in practice. And so whenever we use an MMD with a special kernel, we'll call it a kernel Stein discrepancy or a KSD for short. All right, and there's some other nice properties. We mentioned before that if you pick the right kernel, like if you pick a Gaussian kernel or a Matern, then your MMD is going to control convergence and distribution. Um, that means eventually it will control the integration error for any, any interesting target function, any interesting bounded target function. Well, it turns out that the KSD has the same property if you pick your kernel correctly. So this KP takes as input a base kernel K and then you know, apply some operators to it. And so if you use um, an IMQ kernel as your base kernel, then, it, and if your distribution has strongly log concave tails, so need not be log concave, it can actually be multimodal, but if the tails are strongly log concave and uh, Lipschitz grad log P, then your KSD controls convergence and distribution. Whenever your MMD goes to zero, it means your, your approximation is converging to P in distribution. We're gonna build an algorithm around this KSD. And the algorithm is simply going to greedily minimize the KSD using points sampled from your Markov chain. So again, you're gonna give me your best estimate. You're gonna give me, you're gonna give me your, your long running Markov chain. And I'm only gonna consider those points X1 through Xn, but I wanna find a subset of them. And so I'm gonna pick a subset that greedily minimizes the KSD. How do I do this? First, I start out with zero points in my approximation and I'm gonna pick a single point that gives me the best approximation to P in terms of my kernel Stein discrepancy. 
All right, that's that's easy to do. I'm going to add in the point one by one, and I'm always going to add in the points such that the resulting empirical distribution gives me the best approximation to p in terms of the Colonel Stein discrepancy. And it turns into this like simple minimization problem, and it's a minimization just over the n input points, so it's easy to do. I'll just highlight that the same point can be selected multiple times via this algorithm. And the runtime in the worst case is going to be ns squared if you run it for if you if you if you're outputting a core set of size s. And so for our heavy compression setting, this is an n squared runtime, just like before. And what can we say about the quality of this Stein thinning core set? Well, here's a guarantee. The guarantee has two terms, a decay term and a comparison and a comparator term. Now the decay term in this case is no better than the rate, rate of decay that you get from IID sampling, but this comparator term in blue is much stronger. This comparison says that Stein thinning performs nearly as well as the best simplex reweighting of your input points. So before we were saying we just want to do as well as the input points themselves. But this says you're going to do as well as the best reweighting of your input points. So this means that you should do nearly as well as your mark of chain with all of the burn in removed, because you could always just assign weight you know, zero to the burn-in points and weight one equal weight to all the other points. And we're going to do as well as that. Okay, so that's great. That means I should be able to, you know, essentially remove burn-in via this procedure. It also means I'll do nearly as well as off-target sampling after I do some sort of important sampling reweighting. So if I'm doing tempering, or if I'm, from whatever reason, targeting the wrong distribution, maybe it's due to approximate MCMC, then Stein thinning should do nearly as well as the corrected version of that sample that it, you know that actually targets the true um, target p, and we can we can formalize that. So here's another here's a theorem from our paper, and it says that if you're if for instance you drew your sample iid from the wrong distribution, if you just gave me an iid sample from p tilde that's not p, then under mild conditions, if you run Stein thinning on it, your Stein thinning estimate is still going to converge to p. And it's going to converge to p with a you know a known rate, even though you were sampling from the wrong distribution initially. And so this is very useful for the sorts of tempering issues that we were running into early, earlier. And the result also extends to any um, sufficiently ergodic Markov chain. Okay, so let's see this in action. Let's take a couple of applications. First, correcting for burn-in using Stein thinning. So here I'm showing you the trajectory of a chain run for this Goodwin model. So remember, that's a four-dimensional posterior, so I'm showing you a two-dimensional projection. But these gray points represent the trajectory in this two-dimensional space of my Markov chain. And what I want to highlight is that all of the action, like all, the distribution that I care about, is all inside of this tiny little box. And the rest of these points are just the result of having to explore, to like, you know, reach, that, reach that space eventually. So all of these points are basically what you might call burn-in points. They have nothing to do with the target. And you'd like to discard all of them. And indeed, if you do the standard procedure of running um, MCMC diagnostics to discard burn-in, and then doing thinning, standard thinning of the remaining points, then you'll get a sample that looks like this. But for that, you know, you need your separate MCMC diagnostic, which often involves multiple chains. Alternatively, you can just hand the whole trajectory to Stein thinning and say, give me a good compression that approximates P well. And if you do that, it also just picks a sample out of the, the relevant region and ignores everything else. And that's great. So that's you know, one of the points of sign thinning. And in particular, in this case, more than half of the points would be discarded by Burnin. And so Stein thinning just ignores those points and focuses on the region of, of relevance. OK, and so now if you look at error plots, you see something that is coherent with what I showed you in the last picture. In fact, what you see is that using Stein setting in this case actually outperforms the standard practice of first doing burn in, first removing burn in, and then doing standard thinning. And so I'm showing you some error plots in terms of KSD, which is actually what the Stein thinning, what Stein thinning is optimizing, but also in terms of external metrics like the energy distance, which is just a different distributional quality measure. But in both cases, you see that these colored curves, red, green, and blue, are doing better, which are just different variants of Stein thinning, are doing better than what you would get out of um, burn in burn-in removal plus standard thinning. OK, so now let's talk about correcting for tempering. This is the thing that motivated this, this half of the talk. So remember in that Hinch model, my first concern was that the chains hadn't mixed. And so to deal with this, we're instead going to target a different posterior, a tempered posterior that allows for better mixing. 
And in, in this plot, I'm mainly just showing you that indeed the mixing is better. On the right, I'm showing you what happens if you don't use a tempered chain. If you use two different, uh, two different seeds, two different random runs, two different Markov chains that are independent. If, um, if you don't do tempering, basically the marginals are not overlapping. But if you do do tempering, then the marginals you know, look reasonably like one another, which at least means that mixing has significantly improved. Now I'm going to show you the, now that we know that tempering seems like it's working, at least we have good mixing. Now we want to use that temper chains to get a better approximation to the original target P, to the original posterior P. And I'm going to show you three different ways of doing this. So first, the, bl uh, the black line represents a different compression algorithm called support points. I mentioned it a little bit earlier. And if you run support points on the untempered Markov chains, then you get actually a poor approximation to the true target. And why do you get a poor approximation? Well, it's simply because the, um, the Markov chain hasn't mixed well, and so it's already a bad approximation to start with. So if you approximate it, if you pro if you, even if you approximate it very well, you're still going to have a bad approximation. And that's what you see from this black line here. Approximation is bad. Meanwhile, the gray line is what happens if you apply support points to the tempered Markov chain. This is also giving you a bad approximation. Why is this one bad? This is bad because the tempered chain is not the same as the true, the tempered target is not the same as the true P. The P tilde is not equal to P. And so support points is approximating P tilde well, but we care about P. And so again, we're getting a bad approximation. But if you take your tempered points and you pass them through Stein thinning, which does bias correction, then you get an increasingly good approximation to the true distribution P, which is what we're looking for. Let me summarize then. So I've, I'm, I've presented two different tools for, for summarizing probability distributions more effectively than IID sampling or standard MCMC thinning. The first tool, kernel thinning, compresses your endpoint summary into a square root endpoint summary with um, better than IID approximation error. On the other hand, your second, Stein thinning, does simultaneous compression and reduces the bias due to like, off-target sampling, tempering, and burn-in. And both of these techniques are especially well suited for tasks that incur substantial downstream computation costs. And so if you want to read more about either of them, here are a couple of links to both the papers and to the code. But before, before I, before I uh, open everything up for questions, I just want to mention a couple of other things that we've been doing um, since those lines of work have been put online. And they relate to the questions, some natural questions that you might have about these procedures. So first, about kernel thinning, you know, I, I mentioned that this, we're going to use the square root kernel. You might ask, do you really need a square root kernel? Can you just use your original kernel? And we started answering some of these questions in some follow-up work, which we call generalized kernel thinning. And it turns out that if you just, if you throw away the square root kernel and just replace it with your, your target kernel, the kernel of K that underlies your MMD, then you can still get similar or better MMD guarantees for analytic kernels like Gaussian, IMQ, and SYNC. And on top of that, you can get these dimension-free integration error guarantees for each individual function. So the MMD is kind of like a worst case error across your, across your RKHS, across your, your Hilbert space, your kernel Hilbert space. But if you just look at one function at a time, you can get these square root log n over n single function integration error guarantees using square root endpoints. And you should, for comparison, you should think that IID sampling would just give you n to the minus one quarter. So that's great. And that, in addition, if you have a kernel that is not smooth enough to have a square root kernel, you can use what we call a fractional power kernel and get improved MMD guarantees. And we have a new procedure, which we call kernel thinning plus, which just runs on the sum of the power kernel and your target kernel. And then you get all these benefits that I just mentioned simultaneously. Now, there's one other thing, one other question that might come to mind is, can we speed up thinning algorithms? And can we do that in a way that doesn't really ruin their quality? And I ask this because I mentioned that both the algorithms I mentioned are take n squared time to go from n points down to square root n points. And so you might wonder, can we do that much faster? Can we do this basically in like, you know, linear time and n time? Well, we have, we've been working on a new algorithm. We call it compress, or we call it compress plus plus. And it can reduce the runtime of an n squared thinning algorithm into an n into n, n log squared n, so like near linear time. And you can apply it to whatever, your favorite thinning algorithm. And it turns out that it inflates your error by at most a constant factor. So that's great. And here's just some example plots. Here I was using kernel thinning as the input. So the green curve is kernel thinning. The blue curve is kernel thinning with compress plus plus. And you can see that the error is just about as good but you can more easily scale it to much larger input sizes. By the top, I have the error. On the bottom, I'm showing you 
the run times and the, the gains are significant. So here for dimension 100 with, uh, I think it was 25,000 input points, we're seeing just, it takes over a day. It takes like 32 hours to run um, kernel thinning, but it would take only one hour to run the compressed version. So the 32X speed up with basically the same error. And you see some similar gains uh, in different settings. And you don't just have to apply it to kernel thinning, you take your favorite algorithm. So if you know, you know, one popular compression algorithm is called kernel herding, you could do the same with kernel herding. You still see similar speed ups here, we get like 60X speed ups. And for lower dimensions, we actually see that the compressed plus plus version is actually a little bit better than the original herding algorithm. So you get slightly better error. And so I'll just leave you with that and um, ask for any questions. Thank you. Great, thanks, uh, uh, Lester. So we we have a uh, time for a a couple of questions. Uh, so let me take them from the top. The first one uh, uh, comes from Pierre. Uh, he asks, uh, "How is this method different from Proto Dash algorithm?" Which I've never heard of it. I don't know if you've heard of that uh, algorithm, Lester. I'm not familiar with Proto Dash. I'd love to. If, uh, yeah, so Pierre, if you have a reference, I'd love to learn more about it. I, I haven't heard of it. Okay, you posted the archive uh, link. And oh, great! You can share that. Next question we have from uh, 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 Chak Tan. I think is the way to pronounce that name. So instead of post MC uh, post MCMC processing, could Stein thinning be baked into the MC procedure um, itself? Hmm. Well, I could imagine some ways in which that could be done. So if you think about, you know, because of the, you know, the nature of the markup chain is you always have a state and you, you move on from that state. And so you could imagine, you could think of the selection procedure from Stein thing as like doing a sort of rejection of points. Mm. And so I guess you could start your markup chain at one of the, you know, Stein point selected states. If you're running, you know, sorry, Stein thing is like to say, so if you're running Stein thing at the same time as your MCMC algorithm and, you know, compressing as you go, then instead of just starting from the latest MCMC state, you could start from a, one of the Stein thinning points that was selected, for instance, the last point that was selected, that's a possibility. I haven't given that enough thought to, to know that that would actually work. We do have another algorithm, which you call Stein points MCMC, which has some flavor of integrating MCMC with point selection. Um, there, you're seeking a, a good approximation to a target distribution, so it's a similar goal. And what you do is you ha you have a current state, you from that state you simulate a Markov chain, and then you pick one point from that Markov chain that you just simulated to be the next point added into your representation, and then you repeat. So then you use that point as your as your starting state, and you go on again. And so that might be related to this to this question, but that's a that's a very interesting suggestion. Cool. So the next question from Gigi, and it goes, uh, why do you do greedy optimization for Stein thinning instead of using the kernel thinning optimization for the Steinized kernel? There are a few answers. I guess there, I suppose there are a few answers to that question. One is that, the, okay, so the most, the probably the, the best answer to that question is that actually Stein thinning preceded kernel thinning. So we developed Stein thinning first. <laughs> So kernel thinning didn't exist when we, we developed it. So that's one answer. The second is if you if you do Stein thinning, if you do kernel thinning on the Stein thinning MMD, the, on the KSD, then what you'll be doing is picking a set, picking a, a core set that approximates your empirical distribution well with respect to that MMD. So still the the algorithm is still, you know, it takes as input your, your um, takes as input your, uh, your initial, like your SN, your initial point set. And so still what it's trying to do is um, approximate that well with respect to the MMD, which is still the wrong target. Really want to get rid of that approximation to PN and the PN and just say, I just care about approximating P. And so the algorithm still needs to be changed slightly that the goal, you know, the, the formation of the algorithm is still slightly wrong. But I do think there should be some natural integration of the two that would gain both the, you know, the improved rates from kernel thinning and the, the bias correction from Stein thinning. And so I think that's a, that's like an important next step. Cool. So next question, which 
I kind of also wanted to ask from uh, Jean Gabriel Young. Do you think that it could be useful for MCMC chains generated uh, with efficient samplers like HMC nuts, which the samples already approximated target pretty well? Thanks okay. for the proposals. Oh, definitely. Yeah. So I would say that first of all, the first part of the talk <clears throat> with Colonel Denny was all about starting with something that is a really good approximation and then just compressing it. Even in the best case, right? Even in the best case for MCMC, the best case for MCMC is IID sampling, right? Like you will just, every point is just coming out completely independently and we won't have any of the Markov chain autocorrelation. But even in the best case, your sample size is too big because when you have N points, you're only getting N to the minus one half error. And what you'd like to get to is for, N, for the same level of error, I only use square root N points instead of N. So I only have like a hundred points instead of 10,000. That is what, that is like the regime that the first, the kernel thinning is targeting. And I think Stein thinning is more suitable in cases where you have, where your chain has problems due to biases. Uh, mm. Makes sense. I, I just want to ask, uh, you know, you, you started with the, with this heart simulation, right? And, and this is one of the motivating problems. How, how did that go? Were you able to do a pretty good and fast simulation of the whole heart uh, using some of these these methods so that that's that's a pretty impressive achievement if it's possible. Groups are already like groups, including folks uh, that are some like including some of my collaborators, have already been developing these simulators. So we have the simulator. The simulators are out there, and the question is just mm -hmm. how do we get down to these small representations? And so that yeah. that is st that's still a work in progress. We're still working on it, but this is progress toward that goal. A lot of the work has been in just like, getting those sample sizes down and doing it in a way where we actually get a good approximation to the the hinge posterior. And that has been a lot of the difficulty because at first it was just a question of oh, how do we compress? Then we discovered, oh, well, our Markov chains aren't even mixing. So, you know, even if we compress well, that's not, that's not sufficient. And that, that led to this, you know, needing a procedure that actually has bias correction baked in as well. And so we're taking baby steps toward it, but we're, yeah, my collaborators are still working on that. Makes sense. This is research after all, right? All right, and uh, the the last question I'll ask, and then uh, we'll we'll break. And I, I think you mentioned this that, that there is an implementation somewhere on the interwebs where people could take a look uh, at the actual code. Or is oh, yeah. there? Do you have a slide for it? So ah, here we go. There's a kernel thinning package, so you can download it through pip, or you could, but you can also take a look at their GitHub page to see um, you know the notebooks that recreate the experiments from the from the paper. And then for Stein thinning, there's a website that also points to the Stein thinning package, which is in Python R and I think in MATLAB. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Lester. This was, uh, this was great. Really appreciate you doing this. We will see you in uh, November, everyone. Thanks for, thanks for staying uh, tuned. Thanks so much.